It was the morning of the big premiere of the Notepad, and the bustling energy of movie business glamour buzzed throughout the venue, where the biggest names in entertainment would be gathering that night. Jill had hired Perkins Security Services. It would be Doug's first assignment back since he had suffered terrible injuries when Vivian set fire to the Claire's home. Doug stepped into the chaotic backstage area, where Jill paced back and forth amidst the flurry of last-minute preparations. She spotted Doug approaching and greeted him with a big smile. Doug! Thank goodness you're here! We need everything to be flawless tonight! Jill exclaimed. Doug nodded, thinking that her voice sounded slightly strained. His eyes scanned the surroundings. Don't worry, Jill. Perkins Security Services always delivers. I've got a great team on the job. Jill let out a sigh of relief and her shoulders visibly relaxed. I know that, Doug. You and your company are the best of the best. It's just that this premiere is a big deal for Star Entertainment and we can't afford any hiccups. I'm nervous about making sure that everything is in place. Doug motioned for her to walk with him toward a quieter corner. Jill, rest assured, we've conducted thorough security sweeps both inside and outside the venue. I've got guys and gals strategically positioned to handle any situation. I've also coordinated with local law enforcement to ensure seamless collaboration. Not that I expect any problems, but I always anticipate, just in case. Jill nodded. Good, good. I'm feeling more confident now. What about the VIP entrances, you know, A-listers, that expect a certain level of extra attention? Doug's expression remained stoic. VIP entrances are covered. My personnel are trained to handle high-profile guests discreetly. We've implemented a secure checkpoint system, and only authorized personnel will have access to sensitive areas. Jill glanced at her watch. Doug, time is of the essence. Can you guarantee that everything will be in place before the red carpet arrivals? Doug's gaze met hers with unwavering assurance. Jill, we've timed our preparations meticulously. The security checks are underway, and we'll be ready well before the first celebrity arrives. You can count on it. Jill and Doug walked through the maze of backstage corridors. Jill attempted to shake off the nerves. Doug, I've invested so much in this film. It's my baby. I need tonight to go off without a hitch. The success of the notepad is crucial for my career. Doug turned to face her. Jill, I understand the stakes. Perkins Security Services has a reputation to uphold, just like you do in the film industry. We've got this under control. You focus on making sure the premiere is a hit, and we'll handle the rest. A fleeting smile crossed Jill's lips. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate your professionalism. They parted ways, and Doug headed back into the controlled chaos of the Security Command Center, while Jill resumed her duties in overseeing the final touches to the premiere setup. After his final check, Doug headed home to rest a bit. Walking in and out of the venue was the most exercise he'd had in a while, and he was tired. When Doug stepped through the front door, he winced slightly. It was a familiar twinge in his side from the recent injuries. Mrs. Perkins saw his expression. She set down a cup of steaming tea on the coffee table and greeted Doug with a concerned look. Doug, you're back early. How did the walk through with Jill go? Doug wearily sank onto the couch. It went well, but Jill is nervous about me overseeing security at the notepad's premiere tonight. It's a big responsibility. Mrs. Perkins sat down beside him. Doug, you know how your injuries from the fire still bother you. Maybe it's time to let one of your capable men take charge for tonight. Your health is more important. Doug sighed. I appreciate your concern, but I can't let someone else handle this. The reputation of Perkins Security Services is on the line. I need to be there to ensure everything runs smoothly. Mrs. Perkins placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. Doug, you've been through so much. I can't bear the thought of you pushing yourself too hard, especially after what happened. You've proven yourself time and again. It's okay to take a step back. Doug met her eyes. I know you worry, honey, but I can handle it. I've recovered, and I won't let anything compromise the security of that premiere. Star Entertainment is a major client, and they trust me to deliver. Mrs. Perkins was worried. Doug, I just don't want you to end up back in the hospital. You've been pushing yourself ever since that fire. Doug took her hand in his and offered a reassuring squeeze. I promise I'll be careful. I won't overexert myself. The team is strong, and they'll have my back. Besides, I've been itching to get back into the field. Sitting at home doesn't suit me. Mrs. Perkins studied him for a moment, and then she finally relented. <sighs> All right, but promise me you'll be cautious. If anything doesn't feel right, don't hesitate to hand over the reins to someone else. Your health comes first, Doug. I promise, Mrs. Perkins, I'll be cautious, 
and I won't take any unnecessary risks. Mrs. Perkins nodded, but held on to the worry in her eyes. You'd better come back to me in one piece, Doug Perkins. No heroics. Doug leaned in and kissed her forehead. I love you, Mrs. Perkins. Doug got up from the couch and went over to the desk to make a video call to his team. Mrs. Perkins watched him with concern. She couldn't shake the worry, but she knew that it was pointless to try and talk him out of his desire to handle everything that night. Doug sat at the desk and looked at the various members of his team on the computer monitor. He outlined the security plan, detailing the intricacies of managing the red carpet, VIP entrances, and overall crowd control. Doug spoke with confidence, but in his mind there was a nagging feeling. The importance of the event combined with the high-profile attendees seemed to create lingering doubts. One of his seasoned security officers raised a concern. Doug, are you sure we have adequate measures in place in case there's some kind of major disruption? Doug hesitated for a moment before responding. We've taken every precaution. But as the words left his lips, doubt crept in. He thought, have I overlooked something crucial? The uncertainty intensified when another guard questioned the placement of security checkpoints and the adequacy of the perimeter. Doug's mind raced, grappling with the weight of the responsibility he had assumed. He curtly dismissed the questions and then told everyone to be at the venue even earlier than he originally scheduled them to be. Doug clicked out of the video meeting and stared at the plans spread across his desk. His mind churned with the what-ifs. The concern etched on Doug's face did not escape the watchful eyes of Mrs. Perkins. She placed her hand on his shoulders. You look like you've been carrying the weight of the world. Maybe a nap will do you good. Doug went back to the couch. I'm not sure I can handle the premiere tonight. The doubt, the pressure, it's all getting to me. Ugh, maybe I'm not cut out for this anymore. Mrs. Perkins took a seat across from him. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. You've been through so much, especially after the fire. Maybe this premiere is too much too soon. Doug sighed. I used to be so sure of myself, so confident in my abilities. Now I question if I'll ever be the same. Maybe I'm kidding myself, thinking I can bounce back like before. Mrs. Perkins reached out and gently clasped his hand in hers. Doug, healing takes time. You are not invincible, and that's perfectly okay. It doesn't mean you won't get back to being the man you were, but rushing it might do more harm than good. The weight of his own expectations and the demands of the premiere bearing down on him, Doug admitted, What if I can't do it anymore, Mrs. Perkins? What if I'm not the same man who could handle anything that came his way? Mrs. Perkins met his gaze with unwavering support. Then we'll face it together. You don't have to do this alone. If you need time, take it. Your well-being is more important than any premiere or security operation. We'll figure it out, Doug, as a team. Doug's eyes softened as he absorbed her words. I don't want to let anyone down, especially my team. <sighs> but maybe you're right. Maybe it's time to prioritize healing over proving something to myself. Mrs. Perkins squeezed his hands. Doug, you are not letting anyone down. You are human, and everyone understands that. We'll support you through this. And if you decide it's a permanent change, we'll navigate that path together. Doug managed a weak smile. Thank you, my wonderful wife. I needed to hear that. It's hard to admit vulnerability. Mrs. Perkins kissed Doug on the forehead, then said, Vulnerability doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. We'll face whatever comes our way, and we'll face it together. They hugged, and Doug felt a weight lift off his shoulders. The pressure to be the man he once was subsided, replaced by the reassurance that he didn't have to face the uncertainties alone. He said to Mrs. Perkins, The path to healing might be slow, but with you by my side, it's a journey worth taking. Mrs. Perkins stood and smiled. I think this deserves a few chocolate chip cookies. And milk, Doug added. Mrs. Perkins smiled and went into the kitchen. Now that Doug was going to step down from full control... He needed someone he could trust to oversee security for the night. There was one person who immediately came to mind, and Doug picked up the phone and dialed. Sam answered. His voice was calm and collected. Hey, Doug, what's up? Sam, I need a favor. It's last minute, I know. But I need you to oversee security for the notepad premiere tonight. Something's come up, and I can't be there like I planned. Doug explained. There was a brief pause on the other end of the phone. Doug could sense Sam processing the request. Then Sam responded, Sure thing, Doug. 
I've got your back. I'll make sure everything runs smoothly tonight. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciate this. But Sam wasn't finished. Doug, I have something to tell you, and I may as well tell you now. What's going on, Sam? Is there a problem? Doug asked. Sam took a deep breath. Doug, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but I have to be honest with you. Tonight will be my last job with Perkins Security Services. Doug was surprised by the unexpected revelation. Last job? Uh, Sam, you've been one of my best. What's going on? Did something happen? Sam quickly responded, No, it's not that. I've decided to pursue my dream of becoming an actor. I want to give it my all and try to make a go of it. Doug's initial shock gave way to a mix of emotions. <laughs> I'm proud of you for pursuing your passion, Sam, but I also feel a sense of loss for losing a valuable team member. It's a big decision. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Sam sighed. Uh, I didn't want to let you down, Doug. You've been like a mentor to me, and I didn't want to add more pressure. But I can't ignore this opportunity. I hope you understand. The weight of Sam's decision sunk in. Sam, I appreciate your honesty. Pursuing your dreams is important, and I want you to succeed. But it's going to be tough losing you. You've been an invaluable part of this team. Thanks, Doug. I've learned a lot from you. And I'm grateful for the opportunities you've given me. Tonight, I'll give it my all. And then it's time for a new chapter. Doug wanted Sam to know that he supported him. Sam, I wish you all the best in your acting career. If you ever need advice or support, you know where to find me, Doug said. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate everything. It's been an honor working with you, Sam replied. The premiere would mark the end of Sam's security tenure for Perkins Security Services. But first, everyone had to get through tonight's premiere. With a view of the city lights sprawling outside the window of the luxurious suite that was serving as the Claire family's home after the fire, Natalie stood before the full-length mirror. The gown she had chosen to wear to the premiere of the notepad was a shimmering cascade of midnight blue. Bryce watched with a smile as Natalie put the finishing touches on her ensemble. You look stunning, Natalie. The cameras won't know what hit them. Natalie smiled back. It's been a while since we attended a major movie premiere together. <laughs> Let's make this one memorable. Bryce helped Natalie put on her diamond necklace, and then Natalie helped Bryce tie his bow tie. You look so handsome in a tux, she swooned. Bryce kissed his beautiful wife, and then the couple descended to the hotel lobby. The elegant limo adorned with Star Entertainment's emblem awaited them. The hotel lobby, usually serene, was a whirlwind of activity. Cameras flashed and eager reporters clamored for a glimpse of the power couple. Natalie and Bryce navigated through the sea of unexpected paparazzi. Their smiles never faltered. Natalie! Bryce! Look over here! Natalie! Smile! The photographers yelled and cameras clicked incessantly to capture every step of the couple's journey from the hotel to the awaiting limo. The hotel staff assisted in creating a buffer zone, but the flashing lights and shouting persisted. Inside the limo, Natalie let her composure momentarily slip. Bryce squeezed her hand and offered a reassuring smile. You've got this, Natalie. Natalie sighed. I know it's just part of the game, but it's been so long since I've been through this. The constant media attention is going to take some getting used to again. The limo made its way through the city streets towards the Grand Theater hosting the premiere. When Natalie and Bryce emerged from the limo, the red carpet stretched out before them and the paparazzi frenzy continued. Camera flashes illuminated the night. Natalie gracefully stepped onto the red carpet with her gown flowing behind her. Bryce walked by Natalie's side with his hand on the small of her back. The flash bulbs erupted when the couple stepped out onto the red carpet. Natalie's gown sparkled like a midnight sky, and Bryce cut a suave figure in his tailored tuxedo. Reporters called out questions. Natalie responded with grace, while Bryce exuded an air of confident charm. Paparazzi surged forward, attempting to capture the perfect shot. Natalie and Bryce posed for the cameras. Natalie whispered in Bryce's ear, Our every move will soon be on the front pages and social media feeds. Bryce chuckled, <laughs> Just like old times. Natalie and Bryce approached the entrance. The clamor of the paparazzi slowly faded when the theater doors opened, and they headed safely inside. Inside the premier theater, the ambiance shifted from the buzz of the red carpet to the opulence of the auditorium. Ushers, dressed in elegant attire, guided guests to their plush seats adorned with the notepad-themed programs. Outside, the red carpet continued to beckon the celebrities of the entertainment industry to step into the spotlight. 
Limousines lined the street and dropped off movie stars who wore a dazzling array of gowns and tuxedos. Security personnel, with headsets in place, orchestrated the seamless flow of guests from the cars to the red carpet. A-list actors, acclaimed directors, and influential producers strolled down the red carpet. It was a kaleidoscope of Hollywood's finest. The arrival of international stars, influential producers, and renowned filmmakers added an extra layer of glamour to the night. The gowns were as much a spectacle as the celebrities in attendance. Fashion designers basked in the spotlight as their creations adorned the revered figures of the film industry. Security personnel, under the direction of Sam, worked tirelessly to ensure that everything flowed smoothly. The anticipation outside the Notepad movie premiere theater reached a fever pitch when Tony and Ava, the stars of the movie, arrived in a sleek black limousine. It was the much-awaited entrance of Hollywood's new dynamic duo. The limousine door opened and the atmosphere crackled with electricity. Ava got out of the limo first. She was a vision in a gown that shimmered with every step. The paparazzi unleashed a barrage of camera flashes. Every photographer wanted to capture her radiant smile and graceful movements. Then Tony stepped out of the limo. His tailored tux exuded classic Hollywood charm. Tony put his arm around Ava, and the pair stood side by side for photos. Look at that chemistry between them, a photographer noted. Tony, Ava, over here, shouted the photographers, waving for their attention. The duo obliged and struck poses that showcased their undeniable glamour. Ava's laughter rang through the air as Tony teased, I'd love to get a copy of one of these photos for my driver's license. Requests for interviews filled the air as reporters vied for a moment with the stars. Microphones were thrust in their direction. Tell us about your character, Ava. How are you feeling about tonight, Tony? Tony and Ava fielded the questions with grace and charm. The stars approached the step and repeat, a branded backdrop designed for photo opportunities. Tony, in a moment of gracious humility, stepped slightly to the side. He gestured toward Ava with a gentlemanly flair and said, Ava, you deserve this Olo spotlight for a moment. Let them capture your beauty. You're every bit as stunning as they say. Ava appreciated the gesture and flashed a grateful smile at Tony. The photographers seized the opportunity and their shutters clicked in rapid succession as Ava posed alone against the backdrop. The fan frenzy added another layer of excitement to the spectacle. The barricades around the theater were lined with eager fans who held posters, memorabilia, and cameras in hopes of capturing a moment with their favorite stars. Tony and Ava recognized the enthusiasm. They graciously interacted with their admirers. Autographs were signed, selfies were taken, and the star's genuine appreciation for their fans resonated through the crowd. Inside the theater, Jill moved gracefully through the venue. She was adamant about ensuring that every detail was perfect. Jill scanned the crowd of stars and took in the magic of the evening. She felt pride and anticipation for the film she had poured her heart into. When Jill had seen first Ava and then Tony step out of the same sleek black limousine to a crowd that erupted into cheers when the couple held hands, indicating that she was his date for the night, Jill's heart skipped a beat. She felt a subtle pang of emotion hit her. Jill thought to herself, I know that the dynamics with Tony have changed. We're on a break, so I shouldn't feel possessive or jealous. That's what Jill told herself. But seeing Tony with someone else, and especially that the someone else was Ava, stirred a mix of conflicting emotions. Jill took a deep breath and put on a professional smile. She knew that her focus needed to be on the success of the premiere. Natalie approached Jill with a radiant smile on her face. Jill, you've outdone yourself with this premiere. It's a spectacle. The red carpet, the ambiance, everything is perfect. Jill smiled gratefully. Thank you, Natalie. It means a lot coming from you. I've worked hard to make this night unforgettable. Natalie glanced toward Tony and Ava, and her eyes twinkled with curiosity. And what a surprise to see Tony and Ava together. Brilliant move for publicity, Jill. And I didn't see that coming. Great idea. Jill hesitated for a moment. She was caught off guard by Natalie's assumption that it was her idea. Jill didn't want to admit that she had nothing to do with it. Oh, yes. Well, you know, we thought it would add an extra layer of glamour to the premiere. A little surprise for the fans. Natalie nodded approvingly. You've got a knack for this, Jill. The fans are eating it up. Well played. Natalie saw someone that she knew and told Jill, I'll see you after the film. Jill grappled with the unexpected turn of events. The idea of Tony and Ava arriving together had not been hers, but in that moment, she decided to let the assumption stand. 
Perhaps in the realm of Hollywood, a touch of intrigue and mystery was a potent ingredient for success. Inside the theater, Jill surveyed the audience. The seats were filled with industry luminaries, media, and a few critics. The film, A Labor of Love, was about to unfold on the silver screen, and Jill felt a surge of pride for the entire cast and crew. The lights dimmed, and the opening credits rolled. The screen flickered to life, and the notepad began to weave its narrative of intrigue and emotion. When the film finished, the audience erupted into applause. At the after party, Jill basked in the premiere's success. Natalie approached Jill with a glass of champagne. Jill, the notepad was a triumph, is a triumph. The film is incredible and the buzz is already building. Oh, you've really outdone yourself. Jill beamed with gratitude. Thank you, Natalie. It's been a labor of love and I'm glad it resonated with the audience. Natalie leaned in conspiratorially. And by the way, the Tony and Ava stunt was a genius move. It's already all over the headlines. You know how to play the game, Jill. Jill's smile wavered for a moment. She wanted to clarify once and for all that it wasn't her idea. It was merely a twist of fate. However, a sudden realization struck her. The narrative was already woven, and correcting it might detract from the allure of Hollywood intrigue. Thank you, Natalie. Sometimes a little mystery adds to the magic of the night. Jill replied with a sly grin. Natalie chuckled. <laughs> You've got the Hollywood flair, Jill. Let's celebrate the success of the notepad tonight. It's a night to remember. As the festivities continued, Jill made a conscious decision to set aside the personal aspects of her life. She declared to herself, The breakup with Tony, the assumptions, the undercurrents of jealousy, I'm going to let them fade into the background. Tonight is about the notepad and its success. That must get my unwavering dedication. Surrounded by the glitz and glamour, Jill let herself revel in the success of the premiere. With a successful premiere of the notepad in the books, Bryce was eager to get back out to the property they'd recently purchased and get a better look at it. Liam and Mozart happily tagged along. How about this one, Dad? Liam waved a large stick in the air as he sprinted across a pile of brush, Mozart trailing behind him. Bryce clapped his hands. That's the perfect size, kiddo. Now let's look around and set that stick where we think the front door should go. Liam and Mozart joined Bryce in the center of the sprawling clearing, surrounded by majestic trees and a peacefully babbling stream. Bryce took a deep breath, inhaling the scent of new beginnings. The ashes of the blaze that stole their last cherished home were becoming a more distant memory with every fresh step the Clare family took. Now that Bryce and Natalie had officially purchased this plot of land with their new realtor, Samantha Conway, it was time to begin the process of designing the family's custom chalet. Liam pointed to a gap in the treescape. I think the front door should go right over there. It's cozy, but also welcoming. Bingo, Bryce exclaimed. Let's mark it with your stick. Bryce knew this project was going to be an arduous undertaking, but it was also an incredible opportunity for creativity and learning. He wanted the whole family to feel involved every step of the way, especially Liam. Hey, buddy, Bryce put an arm around his son. I think we should make you an official part of the construction team. How about it, Lieutenant Liam? Liam beamed with pride. Really, Dad? Bryce nodded as Liam continued. Does that make you the captain? Actually, I think our general contractor should be the captain, Bryce explained. Do you remember Biff, the man who helped construct Tony's community theater? Of course, he's the best, but he got hurt really bad. How is he going to build a whole house? Liam wondered. Bryce hesitated at Liam's question. He wasn't so sure himself how Biff would handle his first big contracting project since the accident, especially in such a remote location. But Bryce and Natalie had discussed all their options, and ultimately they decided to give Biff a shot. He was trustworthy and dedicated, and he understood Bryce and Natalie's unique vision for the project. Bryce knelt beside Liam to explain the situation. Well, son, Biff was paralyzed in the accident, so he has to use a wheelchair to get around now. Liam's brow furrowed with concern. A wheelchair? Out here? In the woods? Bryce continued. There's some pretty cool technology with medical equipment these days. Biff might have to do his job a little differently than he used to, but that's what life is all about. Embracing change, just like we did after the fire, right? Liam nodded as a large van pulled across the dirt path toward them. Here's Biff now. He can show us himself. Bryce led Liam toward Biff's specialized van as the door swung open, and Biff lowered to the ground on a mechanical platform. Hey, gang! Biff waved at Bryce and Liam as they approached. 
I didn't know you could drive a car when you're in a wheelchair, Liam muttered softly. You sure can, Biff exclaimed. This van is specially designed with something called handbrakes, since I can't use my feet on the pedals anymore. Biff smiled as he navigated his electric wheelchair toward them with a remote device. And this chair is built for off-roading on tough terrain. It's kind of like the ATV of wheelchairs. Liam perked up. Wow, that's awesome! Bryce put a hand on Liam's shoulder. See, Liam, you can do all sorts of things in a wheelchair. Even play basketball and build a glorious chalet in the woods, Biff chimed in. Bryce shook Biff's hand. Great to have you on the team, man. We're thrilled you were up for the challenge. Mel Haggard couldn't have had more outstanding things to say about your work. Biff swelled with pride. Well, it's quite the opportunity for me, Mr. Clare. I'm thrilled to get the ball rolling. Liam approached Biff's wheelchair, his trepidation bubbling into excitement. I'm Lieutenant Liam on the Clare Chalet Project, so that makes you the captain. I sure like the sound of that. All righty, Lieutenant. Shall I show you the ropes? Said Biff, leading Liam around to the back of the van. Biff used his remote to open the doors, revealing a fully operational command center, decked out with video monitors and all kinds of gadgets. Liam gleefully jumped in to explore. See all those tiny cameras in the back? Biff asked. Bryce and Liam listened closely as Biff explained the various technologies he planned to use in the construction process. Those are GoPros. Every member of my team will be wearing one while on site. The feed is connected back here to these TV monitors, where I'll be observing everything they do and giving directions. What are these? Asked Liam, holding up a walkie-talkie. That's a walkie-talkie, our main source of communication on site, said Biff. Liam hopped out of the truck with two walkie-talkies as Biff showed him how to use them and explained the proper lingo. When you hear someone's message, you say, Roger that. And when you're done talking, you say, over and out. Biff smiled, then turned to Bryce. And now I think your dad and I have some business to get into. There's a ton of permitting paperwork we should get out of the way today. Bryce nodded. I know it's going to be trickier than usual getting permits so far off the grid. It won't be easy, Biff confirmed, but it will be worth it to live out here in the depths of nature without any pesky neighbors around to bother you or get in the way of other building plants. As the men got deeper into the logistical weeds, Liam found himself growing bored. After throwing a ball for Mozart a few times, he finally interjected in the adult's conversation. Dad, can I take Mozart to explore the woods a little bit? Bryce hesitated. He scanned the surrounding area. I don't think so, Liam. I'd rather keep an eye on you until we get better acquainted with the land. Liam was briefly disappointed before being struck with an idea. What if you could keep an ear on me instead? He held up the walkie-talkie with a mischievous grin. Bryce exchanged a knowing look with Biff, who chimed in. Nothing better than a boyhood exploring the woods. Okay, Bryce relented, but only if you keep Mozart nearby and the walkie-talkie on you at all times. Don't go past the dirt road at the far end of those trees. I promise, squealed Liam as he called for Mozart to follow him on his adventure. Bryce watched the duo skip away, his apprehension overshadowed by delight upon seeing his son so enthusiastic to explore nature. As the men returned to their paperwork, Liam and Mozart began navigating through the dense forest. Isn't this so cool, Mozart? We have our very own gigantic forest filled with all kinds of plants and critters to discover. We could probably explore this place forever and never get bored. Mozart howled in response, sticking close to Liam's side. Liam marveled at various plants and stopped to collect cool rocks, following Mozart's lead as the dog sniffed out the forest floor. Then suddenly, Mozart's nose took him sprinting in another direction. Hey, buddy, wait up! Liam shouted after Mozart as he ran to see what the fuss was about. Mozart hovered at the bottom of a towering Douglas fir and began barking incessantly. What is it, boy? Liam studied the tree and spotted a bright green beetle crawling along the trunk. Do you like this bug? Is that it, Mozart? Liam stared at the bug, awash in curiosity, when suddenly he heard the very last thing he expected. A girl's voice shouted down at him from above. He's probably barking at me! Liam stumbled back in shock as he looked up the tree trunk to find the source of the words. He couldn't believe his eyes when he saw a young girl perched casually on one of the branches. Liam blinked in awe as the girl navigated seamlessly down the tree and stood confidently in front of him. She was barefoot and dressed in plain, well-worn clothes with long auburn hair that fell down to her waist. What are you doing in the woods? She asked abruptly. Liam stammered, trying to find his words. All he could muster was, uh, I'm Liam. Mozart let out a howl. And this is my dog, Mozart. My mom plays Mozart on our piano sometimes, the girl replied as she looked Liam up and down. 
My name is Willow, and I know these woods better than anyone on the planet. I've never seen you here before. Liam shrugged. I just got here. I'm gonna live here with my parents and my baby brother. Willow shook her head. No way! My dad says no one lives out here for miles and miles. Liam furrowed his brow. Weird. That's what my dad said, too. Bewilderment simmered between the two children for a moment before Willow piped up again. What's that thing? She asked, pointing to Liam's walkie-talkie. It's a walkie-talkie, Liam noted Willow's confusion. It's kind of like an old-fashioned cell phone. What's a cell phone? You've never heard of a cell phone? Liam exclaimed. Are you from Mars? No way, but I do believe in aliens. A smile spread across Liam's face. Really? Me too! They shared a nervous giggle, then Liam paused. So, what are you doing out here anyway? I was looking for my little brother's toy truck. We lost it a while ago. Liam's face lit up. That's the truck I found. I have it back in my room. Or the place where we're going to build my room. I can get it for you. It's back that way. Liam pointed behind him. Or maybe it was this way. Uh-oh. I can't remember which way I came from. Where's your dog? I bet he knows the way back. Willow offered. That's when Liam realized that Mozart was no longer standing by his side. He froze with fear for a moment before urgently calling out, Mozart! Mozart, where are you, boy? Just as Liam was beginning to panic, Willow slithered back up the tree to scan the area. There he is, she shouted. Liam exhaled with relief. What's he doing way over there? Willow peered into the brush ahead. Uh-oh, he's following a skunk. Is that bad? Liam asked. Oh, yeah, because he could get... Willow squinted her eyes. Oh, no, he just got sprayed. Willow leaped down from the tree right as Mozart came bounding over to Liam in a frenzy. That's the worst thing I've ever smelled in my life! As Liam went to cover his nose and mouth with his shirt, he unknowingly dropped his walkie-talkie to the ground. Willow scrunched her nose. Oh, it's the worst. This happened to my dogs a few times. So what do we do? Liam asked desperately. You have to give him a special bath with some kind of potion, Willow replied. Liam looked at her in dismay. But I don't have a bathtub or any potion. A confused Mozart looked up at Liam, whose eyes were beginning to fill with tears. Willow took Liam by the hand. Let's go find my parents. They'll know what to do. As Willow began leading Liam and Mozart deeper into the forest, Liam looked over his shoulder. I don't know if I should. I don't even know you. And I think my dad is back the other way. Willow turned to Liam briskly. Do you want to get rid of this skunk smell or not? Come on! Liam hesitated for a moment as Willow began running. He took another whiff of Mozart, then began racing through the trees after her. Wait up! The faster we run, the faster that smell goes away! She shouted. As the kids disappeared into the woods, Liam's forgotten walkie-talkie crackled to life with Bryce's voice. Come in, Liam. It's time to head back. Liam, go for Liam. Hello, Liam! But Bryce's urgent pleas echoed through the forest unheard. Liam was panting so hard, he didn't even notice when Willow crossed the dirt road, the boundary his father made him promise not to cross. Liam tried to catch his breath. We're almost there! Willow pointed up ahead. What is that? Asked Liam, stunned at the sight of a primitive-looking cabin in the distance. A wide smile spread across Willow's face. That's my house! 